Good morning. So welcome to Employers Responses to the Docs decision. Thank you for joining us this morning. If you are would like to get MCLE credit, and probably you would, there's a sign-in sheet here. You have to put in your name, the time you check in, and the time that you leave. If you don't sign in, you won't get the MCLE credit. Uh, you probably have seen some of the materials. There was a link that was sent out yesterday. Um, there will be additional materials added, so you can go back and get the materials later on. They will also be available um, on the MCLE Spectacular page. Uh, your attendance certificate will be available and emailed by mid-December. If you are a CCBA member, your attendance certificate will also be located in your My Events tab on the website. And at the end, please fill out an evaluation form and drop it in the box at the registration desk, or you can scan and email it to Ann Wolf. So, my name is Maggie Grover. I am currently the head of the Employment Law Section for the Contra Costa County Bar Association. We are always looking for new members on our leadership. Chris here is also on a, in our leadership. Too late, I already joined. <laughs> <laughs> And I would love to have newer lawyers, younger lawyers, lawyers with new ideas, because we seem to do a lot of rehashing. Um, so talk to me if you would like to join in the leadership. I have the distinct honor today of introducing two people that need no introduction. The first is Jim Rosnahan, he's senior counsel at Morrison and Forrester. Now, when I finished law school, my trial tactics professor found out I was moving to the Bay Area. And he said, there are two people that you should go see whenever you can. And one of them was Jim Brosnahan. He doesn't know he really has a groupie. <laughs> <laughs> Jim has so many awards that if I read all of them, it would take the entire section session. So I'm just going to say he's among the 30 top trial lawyers in the country. He's represented some very high profile clients and um, he's been recognized as, okay, I've got new eyes here. Um, re received the American Ends of Court Award for professional and Professionalism and Ethics to recognize a lifetime devoted to the highest standards of ethical practice, competence, and professionalism. And that really sums up Jim in a nutshell. He is always there when you need him to speak. He's always entertaining. And you can find more Jim entertainment because he's um, publishing a memoir of his cases. It will be coming out next July, published by Roman and Littlefield. So it should be a good read. He's been talking to us a little bit about his editing and he's been doing that. Now, the other person, Beth Parker, also needs no introduction. I met Beth as a very new lawyer. And I assumed that she had, oh, 10 or 15 years of practice because when I met her, she was president of the San Francisco Women Lawyers Alliance, which she was one of the founding mothers. And she has been on multiple boards. She is currently the general counsel of three different Planned Parenthood affiliates and their action funds. She's been speaking a good deal since Dobbs. She mentioned that she's gotten up at seven the other day to, to speak. She practices um, in her own law firm where she is doing mediation these days and is a Harvard graduate. So please enjoy them. And I'll turn it over to Beth. Hi. Thank you all for having me speak this morning. Um, so I've been practicing almost 40 years. And the Dobbs decision presents more issues it could constitute a law exam. It not only upends concepts of federalism that have long applied to the provision of health care and reproductive justice issues, um, it impacts many areas outside, such as substantive due process cases, involving interracial um, and same-sex marriage, 
as well as the right to privacy. And it presents issues for lawyers, no matter whether you uh, counsel providers, patients, employers, institutions, or, mere, or legislatures. Um, and as Jim will explain, it also presents huge opportunities for lawyers to get involved in issues that are going to have a profound impact on many ordinary Americans' lives. So before we get into those issues, I want to give some context, both about the decision, how we got here, and what the impact has been. And then I think we're going to have a discussion about, in particular, what it means for employers. So first, um, as many of you know, um, the law pre-Dobbs began in 1973 when Roe v. Wade was decided by a 7-2 court. And that case held that women had a constitutional right to terminate their pregnancy, that abortion was a fundamental right premised on the right to privacy in healthcare decisions. And what Roe did was establish a trimester framework. In the first trimester, there could be no regulations. In the second, states could regulate abortion to protect the health of the pregnant woman. And in the third trimester, which is post-viability, states could ban, but they must have an exception for the life or health of the pregnant woman. And after the first trimester, regulation had to pass a strict scrutiny test which was the highest form of constitutional protection. Now, post-Roe, there were a number of other abortion decisions that made their way to the Supreme Court, but the most significant of which was Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which came out in 1992. That was a plurality decision. And that case reaffirmed Roe's central holding that abortion was a constitutional right. But it rejected the trimester framework, and it replaced it with viability as the sort of deciding line. And that case held that a woman had the right to have an abortion pre-viability and obtain it without undue interference from the state. Um, states could not ban abortion pre-viability. And in fact, if they wanted to pass a regulation, they could not impose a substantial obstacle to the right of a woman to elect abortion. Post-viability, the court said, a state could regulate, even ban abortions, but it still had to contain an exception for a woman's life or health. So what did that look like in America? So pre docs there were almost a, a million abortions a year. Um, one in four women of reproductive age would have an abortion in their lifetime. It was a very simple, actually a very common medical procedure. And the reason is that about half of pregnancies are unintended, and about half of those ended in abortion. And who has abortions in the United States? The predominant number, or the predominant um, uh, women who do are low income. 60% um, already have children. And the majority report they do so because they have some disruptive life event. They've lost a job, they have to move, they've broken up in their relationship. And interestingly, more than 51% have had contraceptive failure because other than long-acting contraceptives, which have only come on the market relatively recently, most contraceptives are not particularly effective. And for reasons that are beyond this talk, the majority of abortions in the United States actually occur at standalone facilities, either non-specialized clinics like Planned Parenthood, which offer other forms of reproductive and primary health care, or independent abortion clinics. Only a very small number of abortions occur at hospitals or in doctors' offices. And the overwhelming majority of abortions, close to 93%, occur in the first trimester, that's before 13 weeks. And about 78% occur uh, nine weeks or less, and that's significant because about 20 years ago, the FDA approved medication abortion, which is a two-pill regimen. You take the first pill typically in a clinic or a doctor's office, and the second pill in the privacy of your own home. And now medication abortion has become the predominant, the most popular form of abortion, over 54%. And I tell you all this 
because a lot of this has uh, implicates a lot of the issues that have come up post DOPS. So how did we get to DOPS? Well, there are actually two parallel strategies that the anti-abortion movement put in place decades ago that ended up resulting in the Supreme Court reversing Roe and Casey. The first was they passed an enormous, first place they placed in many state legislatures anti-abortion legislators. And they began to propose and enact abortion restrictions. And this encompassed a wide variety, both a restriction about, about methods of abortions, reasons for having abortions, you know, ultrasound, parental consent requirements, um, limitations on where abortions could occur. It was a whole panoply and a number of bans. And this grew and grew and grew, these, these restrictions. Um, so by 2021, over 108 restrictions were passed in 19 states, including 12 abortion bans. And many of these abortion, uh, in many of these restrictions and bans were challenged and enjoined because they clearly violated Roe versus Casey, but they started wending their way through the courts. The second parallel um, strategy that occurred was obviously the election of Donald Trump, who was known to be anti-abortion. And Trump himself said that overturning Roe versus Wade would happen automatically because he was putting pro-life justices on the, in the court. And indeed, Trump was successful in appointing 231 federal judges at all three levels. They were overwhelmingly male, young, and white, and they were specifically picked for their opposition to abortion. And as we all know, this culminated in the appointment of Justice Amy Coney Barrett shortly before the election, after Justice Ginsburg passed away, and that cemented a conservative majority. And so currently, of nine justices, six were appointed by Republican presidents and three by Democrats. And it's widely thought that this is the most conservative bench we've had since the 1930s. So the Dobbs decision itself. Dobbs involved a ban on abortions beginning at 15 weeks, except in a medical emergency or a severe fetal abnormality. And this law was so extreme that both the district court and the Fifth Circuit, which is very conservative, struck it down as unconstitutional. So it was quite surprising when the Supreme Court took it up. And over time, the question that it decided to take was whether all pre-viability prohibitions on elective abortions were unconstitutional. In other words, it was looking at the core issue in both Roe and Casey. And in fact, what Dodds did was it found there was no longer a federal constitutional right to abortion, and it explicitly overruled Roe and Casey. In fact, as Justice Alito said, the Constitution makes no reference to abortion, and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision, including the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. This decision was so extreme that Justice Sotomayor predicted during oral arguments over Dobbs, she said, will this institution survive the stench that this creates in the public perception that, it's con that the Constitution and its reading are just political acts. What is particularly chilling about the decision is Justice Thomas's concurrence. Because Justice Thomas said, he was not just looking at abortion, but he was inviting challenges to all the other substantive due process rights, including the right to contraception, the right to um, choose your sexual pro partners, the right to gay marriage. Interestingly, he did not mention the right to interracial marriage, although that too is a substantive due process right. And the dissent, which is by the three Democratic justices, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan, they were the only opinion that actually discussed the practical implications of this decision. And they called a spade for a spade. They said that one result of today's decision is certain, the curtailment of women's rights and their status of, as free and equal women. 
And they commented that a state can always now, as of today, they can force a woman to give birth, prohibiting even the earliest abortions. And a state can transform what, when freely undertaken, is a wonder into what, when forced, may be a nightmare. So what are the implications? We were concerned that once Dobbs came down, once Roe and Casey were reversed, that 26 states were poised to ban abortion. These are the ones shown in dark blue on the map. They're predominantly in the South and the Midwest. And this was for two reasons. Many of these states had what were called pre-Roe bans. These were laws that were passed 50, 75, 100 years ago banning abortion that would come back into life once Roe was reversed. And a number of other states passed what were called trigger bans, which were once those cases were reversed, then abortion would be banned. And some states had both. These states cover more than 36 million women, which are nearly half the women of reproductive age in our country. That means half the women of this age could lose access to abortion. So, as of today, and I've been trying to keep this up to date as best I could, 17 states have banned abortion in whole or in part. There's, there's a huge amount of litigation going on, so 13 of the bans actually have been enjoined, including most recently this week, Georgia. And as a result, 66 clinics in 15 states have stopped offering abortion care. Um, Go back. Um, and 14 of those states would have had 125,000 abortions in 2020, and now they have absolutely no providers, and 26 clinics are shut down altogether. So this is a map of the states, the red states, are where abortion currently is banned, in whole or in part. Um, the gray states are where there's a partial ban, meaning you can have abortions up to about 15 weeks. The green states, abortion is legal. And the light green states are those where there were bans that have currently been enjoined. And the pink states in this map show where all the litigation is pending. So there's, there's a huge amount of litigation, and surprisingly, um, some of it has been quite successful. But there's just ongoing battles, and as we know, certain states like Arizona, it's it's very volatile situation. Um, a ban went into place, and it was enjoined, and it was lifted, and now it is enjoined. You know, so just think about it. if you're a provider in some of these states where there's ongoing litigation, it's just creating tremendous chaos. So what is the impact of DOPS? Well, a study just came out this uh, about two weeks ago from the Society of Family Planning that found that there's only slightly fewer abortions. Actually, the bans really haven't had a big impact on stopping abortions altogether. There's only been about a 6% decrease. What they found is that there's been a huge increase in virtually only services, about a 33% increase. That's the provision mostly of medication abortions via telehealth. And one of the interesting developments in this area is there's now an overseas company called Aid Access, which is providing uh, medication, uh, medications uh, for abortion over the internet. Um, and we will see what's going to happen with that. But we do know that there's just a huge increase in the distance to access abortion, meaning women must have to delay the procedure, they have to incur tremendous costs and threats to their own safety. They have to find childcare, they have to take time off of work um, or school to travel very long distances to access abortion. And one study found that about 40% of patients have to travel an increase of 249 miles. Um, and this is a map I put together of um, a very recent study that shows patients are traveling to other states. This is done by regions, actually. Um, if you look at this on a state by state, it's even a more interesting story. Um, but in the banned states, which are the pink, um, they, they, their number of abortions has decreased by 95%. Um, in restricted states, it's actually increased to 32%, and that's because a lot of the restricted states, those are states which no longer, which uh, you can have abortion post 15 weeks, they're often in the middle of areas uh, where there are a lot of bay, total banned states, and so uh, women are obviously traveling there. And then legal states, um, it's only gone up 11%, 
But that's because states like California were actually a long ways away from any of the band states or the Northeast. Um, so what we're seeing is states like um, Illinois, Kansas, uh, North Carolina, that that's where women, which are bordering on the band states, that's where women are traveling. But that's what's going on. And those who are most impacted are those who are the most vulnerable amongst us. Uh, typically people of color. 56% of black people live in the South, which where abortion is primarily banned, and they just lack the economic resources, they're underemployed, underinsured, and they're often fear arrest. So those are the individuals who are having the hardest time accessing abortion. The studies show that immigrants feel deportation. They're scared to seek medical appointments. Uh, they feel like they can't leave their state because of customs officials. And in the Asian American community, they already have low rates of insurance coverage, language barriers, and racial profiling. So these groups that are already extremely vulnerable in our country are the ones who are having the hardest time. There's a profound impact on providers. These bans consciously target medical providers, not patients. So if a provider performs abortion in a banned state, they face felony, imprisonment, and fines. They can lose their medical license, and they're put on what's called the OIG exclusion list, which means that they often cannot practice just not just in that state, but in any other state, and cannot see Medicare patients. The impact on providers is, each, is actually much broader than just providers who perform abortion. Already there are articles coming out and studies showing that um, providers that do cancer treatment or prescri prescribe uh, tetrateratogenic drugs, which are drugs used for um, things such as bipolar disorder, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple myeloma, these are drugs which are known to cause uh, fetal dis disformities and typically, um, before a provider prescribes these drugs, they tell a patient you cannot be pregnant, and if you get pregnant, you're going to need to have an abortion because that's a known consequence of these drugs. So there's a lot of very complicated issues that providers in a wide range of medical fields are now confronting. There's also a lot of interesting ethical questions being presented for reproductive assisted technologies um, and miscarriage management. What are, what are providers who have to um, uh, provide medical uh, help on those issues? What, what are these bans, what are the implications of these bans for them? We also know that there's a big impact on the training of new medical providers into the future. Um, there had been a requirement that medical schools offer abortion um, uh, training in their OBGYN programs. Well, about half of those programs are in states that currently ban abortion. So we will not have a new generation of providers with this um, expertise. And the impact on care is profound. There's tremendous confusion in the medical world um, because the landscape is constantly shifting. We know already that there's certain hospitals that are failing to provide services for sexual assault and rape, particularly in states like Texas where Texas has said that in TALA, which is the law that says hospitals have to treat patients for emergencies, Texas has challenged that law and says it doesn't apply in Texas, and a Texas court has agreed. We know providers are refusing to treat ectopic pregnancies and miscarriages because they can't tell is it is a miscarriage or is it an abortion, and pharmacies are refusing to dispense emergency contraception or methotrexate, which is one of the tetragenic drugs that I was speaking about. And what about employers in all of these states? Um, and educational institutions, which um, obviously are providing education to a tremendous number of uh, women of reproductive age. Well, the, the employment community has responded pretty well. They're trying to, and I think we're going to have more discussion of this, um, ensure that they have medical benefits, travel assistance, paid time off and public support on these issues that can play a very large role. Um, 
And in fact, um, this chart shows that a large number of companies, I think there are over 120 employers so far, have announced some travel benefits, um, including a lot in the tech and finance uh, and professional industries in particular. But um, these benefits are presenting a lot of interesting legal issues. Um, what if a, a company with offices in Texas covers abortion care for an employee in Texas? Um, what if they provide travel for that employee to, to travel from Texas to, say, California or another legal state? What if they give them time off? Are they going to be accused of aiding and abetting in an abortion? And in fact, uh, several uh, groups, including the Texas legislature, have written letters to employers in some of these states claiming that the travel um, benefits violate pregnancy, disability, and religious discrimination laws. And I read just le yesterday that the EEOC has instituted, one commissioner, a very conservative commissioner, has now instituted several investigations into some of these companies. Um, claiming that they may be violating these laws by providing travel benefits to pregnant women but not to um, employees in other, um, in other areas. Um, so we know that on the horizon we're going to see a lot of legal battles. I was, I was telling my um, co-panelists a moment ago that prior to um, the election uh, my sense was that we were not seeing a lot of litigation right now because the anti-abortion movement was really surprised at the enormous impact Dobbs has had in terms of the public and its reaction, and so they were not pursuing a lot of these challenges. Um, but we anticipate come January we're going to start seeing a lot more enforcement and potentially a lot more proposed uh, legislation. And it's going to have profound impacts both on what we call vertical federalism, which we potentially could have bans uh, bans or laws at the federal level, as well as horizontal federalism, which are, you know, bans in certain states or restrictions in certain states, um, challenging what happens in other states. And then I just wanted to end quickly that, so one bright note is that the public is actually um, very different, um, overwhelmingly different, in its reaction than most of these state legislators, legislatures um, and the Supreme Court. Over 80% of Americans think that abortion should be legal some or all the time. Um, and pre-election they indicated they were motivated by the decision to go out and vote. And that's what we're finding in the post-election um, polls. And in fact, most voters are opposed to most aspects of these bans. Um, and this played itself out in the elections. There were five different initiatives, um, some that wanted to put abortion on into the Constitution, such as California, Michigan, and Vermont, and others that wanted to put something really opposed to abortion in their Constitution. And all of those, the voters um, came out in, um, uh, and, and supported. Um, so with that, we will turn it over to the Thank you. Now, while we're switching slides around, does anybody have questions for Beth? She is just an amazing font of knowledge. Go ahead. I was wondering, were there any, uh, it looks like there were the six different propositions on the vote ballot, three pro abortion rights and three anti. Were there any, was there any legislation um, that you know of that kind of offered a yes or no vote to voters for like, do you want it banned, do you want it protected, or was it always just, do you want protections on the Constitution, like in our state Constitution, yes or no, do you want it banned by the state Constitution? Yes it, it, no? was the, it was the latter. Um, yeah, it was the latter. It was, a, it was one way or the other way, not a choose between the two. Is there any way to make a choose kind of proposition in just like the way that that's done, or does it always have to be a yes or a no for a single it, it tends to be a yes or no. In different states, you know, some states you could put a ballot initiative directly on the ballot by having enough signatures, and others have to go through their legislature first. So I think in some of the more conservative states like Kentucky or Kansas, it, that's why it has to be, it's going to be an anti because those are very conservative legislatures. But that's why it was so surprising that the public actually came out very differently than their legislative bodies in those states. Were any of those votes close? No. Yes. 
<laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> that, that just that feels really good. Like, the I, reproductive I really justice good. community is thrilled by the result of the election. And I was telling my colleagues, I heard um, the other night in Georgia that all the polls said that health care and reproductive rights were the two biggest reasons that people came out to vote in even a state like Georgia. And we've got one question in the back. Uh, you said, talked about interstate travel bans. I think Justice Gorsuch said in dicta that he believed that a ban on interstate travel for purposes of abortion would violate the strict scrutiny right to interstate travel. Actually, it's Kavanaugh. Right. Sorry, Kavanaugh. Yeah. Sorry, Kavanaugh. Yeah. yeah. That's a very interesting issue. Um, I think most lawyers think there's this constitutional right to travel. I actually just wrote a resolution for the ABA on it. The law is not as solid as we would hope. And I think there's a big concern that some banned states are going to pass laws that will restrict the rights of their citizens to travel to another state. Um, and I think the thought is that Kavanaugh, because he basically said he would uphold the right to travel, and probably Roberts will too. So if it goes up to the Supreme Court, I think um, my guess is we will win that issue. But it's a little scary to think that we live in the United States where we do not really travel from state to state. Okay, now let's talk about what employers are actually doing. I, listening to Beth, I was thinking, and I guess I've known this all along, it's great that employers are adopting policies to pay for travel for their employees, but it really isn't assisting the most vulnerable because they may not be employed or they may have other reasons not to travel. But it's great that employers are doing this. And little jaded part of my heart thinks that employers are doing this not so much to benefit their employees, but because it's an attractive way to entice people to come work for them. We support women here. We have a policy to provide travel assistance if a woman needs an abortion. They may never have to pay or may not pay a lot for that, but a, a candidate for a job is going to look at that employer and say, hey, I like their politics. I will go work there. So that's, I think, little jaded me, why we have these policies. Now, the policies come in a variety of flavors. Some larger employers have had travel assistance for medical procedures for a long time. Why? Not because you couldn't get a medical procedure in Oklahoma, but because they are large enough to pay for a medical care facility or have a regular arrangement with a medical care facility, and it's less expensive for them to cover travel and medical care if somebody goes to their centrally located medical care facility. And so now, Abortion is covered under that policy and existing policy. Others are including abortion travel in their existing health care policies. They're rewriting their health care policies and saying abortion travel is going to be covered as well as um, time to recover and time off. Others are doing a supplemental health care policy. Why? Because they don't want to necessarily have that in states that do have the ability, the woman has the ability to have a safe and legal abortion, they want to provide it only in those states where there's not that right. Or they may want to just focus, have one focus on that. And then the last one, and this is the one that I'm seeing from a lot of smaller employers, is a reimbursement for the travel. Yes, you go and have your abortion, you come back, you give us your hotel bills, you give us your airline tickets, and we'll reimburse you. Each of these has some potential problem, which, with any luck, will be on the next slide. Okay, the first one is employee privacy. Now, there are many women who don't want to talk about the fact that they needed, have had, or want to have an abortion. How does the employer handle the issue of reimbursement? If they have a third-party health care provider, they can go directly, the employee can go directly to the health care provider and submit their requests and get paid and get coverage. But if it's an, an internal 
policy, like a reimbursement policy? Do you have to submit your reimbursement to human resources? And are you going to be reluctant to do that if that's the concern that you have? Um, the second problem is practicability and affordability. Do, does a woman who needs abortion get time off? If it is a reimbursement policy and you have to go have the services, go through the travel, and you are a minimum wage earner, it's not going to be affordable for you. So for those employers that are uh, writing policies up based on reimbursement, I am urging them to adopt a policy where they can pay estimated costs up front to make it feasible for the woman to do the travel and get the care she needs. And there are tax implications. And I am not a tax expert. I'm not going to talk much about them, but the medical care is covered as a tax exempt issue. The travel to get medical care will not necessarily be a tax exempt issue. So if somebody gives you a thousand dollars to travel to California for abortion care and stay in California, you could be paying taxes on that thousand dollars. So I'm again urging employers to look at that. Depending on the way they've structured their policy, they may want to increase the reimbursement so the woman doesn't have a negative tax implication, so that she has enough to, to actually pay for the taxes. Discrimination claims. What procedures might need to be covered? Are people going to be claiming that any time there is a procedure that's not available in Oklahoma or Georgia or Florida, but is available in another state, that the employer should be paying for that. If, for example, they have gender alignment surgery, can't remember the name for that all the time, if that's not available everywhere. Do they have to send somebody to Colorado where there's a, a huge gender alignment community in order to avoid a discrimination claim? I was wondering, there are some medications that are not available in the United States but are available in Canada and Mexico? Do they have to, to be able to send somebody out of the country? Can they define the, what is going to be reimbursed, what travel is going to be reimbursed to avoid discrimination claims? Because, face it, abortion care, one gender only. Um, and then the big thing is criminal liability. And we are seeing states that have announced and are passing uh, prohibitions on the travel, they are passing the aiding and abetting laws, and they are threatening employers that adopt these policies, and that's where it turns over to Jim. Oh, thank you. It's always good to get information about something that has rocked the country. Uh, I know I've enjoyed listening to it. Um, the other thing is, I would give anything to return to the active practice of law right now, and that's perverse. That is to say, that's, that's a lawyer's thing. And uh, my assignment is to talk about what lawyers are doing, what they're going to do. And I do have some forecasts about what they're going to do, because I have stumbled on a subject I actually know something about. I know about lawyers. I mean, I've been with them a long time. <laughs> And I know they love a good fight. And there are no lawyers now, and there will be uh, all over the country. Uh, so that's my, that's my subject. Uh, the wife, Carol, Judge Brosnan, retired, and I were driving down Route 5 in late June. I was going to give a talk. I think gave a talk on latest Supreme Court cases. And I was debating whether I should forecast my opinion about what Roberts and Kavanaugh would do. And I thought, if there's any chance to say Roe v. Wade, that Roberts will convince Kavanaugh that, uh, he, he, not now, not this case, but let's not go there, let's incremental kind of a thing. And a voice filled the radio 
in our car, and it said something like, it would appear that the Supreme Court has revoked Roe v. Wade. And an hour and a half later, I stood up to give my talk in Fresno, trying to be professional. And I had actually been given a copy of the opinion, 71 pages. And I felt the way I felt over the years a couple of times. Everything just changed. Every concern, every fear that we had about that court is now real. And that it goes beyond abortion, well beyond. And that's the way I felt. I gave the talk. And I, earlier in the year, I kept hearing about social media. Social media, blah, 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 blah. And so I went to a young lawyer and I said, uh, quote, what is social media? <laughs> I, I mean, I was born in 1934. What do you want from me? We had radios. Come on. And uh, they said, you can go on, you can type, and you can say anything you want. Well, that was it for me. I mean, yeah, okay. So I, <laughs> I got a LinkedIn uh, thing, as we say. <laughs> as we say, it's social media. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, shortly after the Dobbs decision, uh, drawing myself up with my computer, uh, I, I put a post out, and here's what it said. The Attorney General of Texas, by the way, the Attorney, you know, if you're going to get into these things, who are these people? That's the question I've been asking since Dobbs. Who are these people? And the Attorney General of Texas is, by the way, indicted. But uh, I, I'm getting off the subject, sort of. Uh, the Attorney General of Texas has threatened Sidley and Austin, the seventh largest law firm in the country, uh, a distinguished law firm committed to the rule of law with criminal prosecution for its offering to pay travel expenses for abortion. Speaking for myself, Every lawyer, every bar association, at every level, and every law office in the United States, I get this way sometimes, needs to come to the defense of our brothers and sisters in that respected firm. So, publish that. I got 1,174,000 impressions or hits. And I, had, I seriously asked people, is that good? <laughs> <laughs> I got uh, 11,000 likes. I got a following of 4,000 people. It's like a cult. You know, I, 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 need a, I, need a, I need a white robe and uh, uh, follow me. Uh, we're going, where are we going? I don't know. Uh, 629 comments, uh, which I read some of. And 193 people posted it, sending it off to somebody else. Well, that was too much fun. <laughs> By the way, a serious point. I don't know how many people, when I tell them this, have said, you know, you don't want to, Roseanne, you don't want to do that. I mean, there's crazies out there, they'll get you. I said, if they have any sense, they will not attack an Irish American. That is not a good thing to do. Uh, so I sent off a couple of others, and they uh, got less responses, but they got, they got very good ones. My subject is what will lawyers do and what will law firms do, and I include uh, a law firm, let's say, of four, four lawyers in between some size and law firms of a thousand lawyers. And we're going to talk about details of what the pressures are on the law firms. Um, I followed that up with an article, uh, which was published, uh, about who these people are. There's 11 members of the Texas legislature, and they've accused law firms, and they're going to get them indicted, and they're going to do all this stuff. 
One of the 11 was associated with a law firm. His name disappeared that day. It's like law firms do that. It's like, who? We, know, we don't know any such person as that. And I'm going to explain why I think that happened, because it's relevant to what the lawyers are doing. The Texas legislature currently has 150 House members and 31 senators. 48 of the 181 are women. If we're going to get into a big fight with Texas and California, this is important. One third are attorneys. Maybe that'll help. The largest law firm in Texas is Aiken Gump. 60% of the lawyers in that firm are women. That's important. Are there old guys? I shouldn't attack old guys, really. <laughs> I really shouldn't. They're my people, okay? I shouldn't do that. But are the old guys thinking about how nice it was in the 60s or 70s or something? Uh, have, they, have they really lost it? Um, they were recently voted, that law firm was recently voted a good place for women to work. Uh, let's go to the next one, please. Thank you. Um, and the next one after that. There is a, in the materials, and it, you may not have it yet, but you will get it, a sample employer policy. This is very tricky, and I make no guarantee that this is going to work, but it is an effort to do what law firms must do. What are the, what are the two things in law firms that matter? We're going to discuss both of them. Recruiting people, getting them to come in the best you can get, number one, and markets. In other words, going somewhere and being somewhere because all law is local. It, it just, that's the way it works. You, may, you might travel to other places, but it's local. So let's quickly go through the uh, contract and I'll comment on a couple of parts to it, okay? So we go to the next one. Yeah. I don't have this version. Oh, okay. It didn't get to me. That's okay. Sorry. There's a provision in there that you'll want to focus on. And uh, the, the provision is that, and, and this goes right to what has been said, privacy is important. So we have, let us say, a woman who is pregnant. There are privacy concerns. But privacy concerns don't govern when there's a crime. It is, because I've tried a lot of cases, criminal cases. If you, you know, it is no answer to say, well, I'm accused of a crime, but that was private. It doesn't work that way. So in this section, they have structured it, and you can read this, uh, and it's a good effort, I think. You can read this provision that there is a third party who's in charge of all this outside the firm. And the firm, and this is legitimate, the firm doesn't want to know, is not asking what the medical procedures were because that's a private matter. And I think that argument will be made somewhere and I think it's a good argument. Uh, they, they're not just ducking the reality of it, but uh, they, they don't want to know. So that's the section to look at in that contract and be aware of the dangers of it. Now, I promised you I would talk about recruiting. I taught, uh, I had the great pleasure of teaching at Berkeley Law for about 10 years. They're very nervous bunch when they're in law school now. I don't know what they're worried about because they're going to get paid $140,000, whatever. And, uh, but they're nervous. 
and they're deciding where to go. And they come in, a number come in the first year at that law school, and they're going to represent poor people. They're going to work on nonprofits. They're going to do all that. And pretty soon they have $140,000 debt. And uh, what's going to happen with that? So there's a whole transition there with the students. And they want to go, as has been said, and I agree with this, when you interview them, talk to them, they want to go to a place that would be comfortable. They want to go to a, a firm that is known to do the right thing. And a firm can do the wrong thing one year, and there's some story in the paper, and all of a sudden they go here, they don't go there. Suppose that this is a firm that has decided that it's going to cover medical, but it's not going to have anything to do with abortion. Imagine that. Given the voting patterns we've heard about today, and they want to know about that, this is a big issue. It's not going away. In fact, it's going to get worse. So they will choose what firm to go with based on their reading of whether they can be comfortable. We all did that probably, one way or the other. And the firm has that pressure. You know, the essence of putting a good firm together, whether you're four lawyers, 40 or 400, is the skill of the people you can get. And if you can't get skilled women, in 2022 in your firm, you've got a problem. You have a serious problem. The other part of it is the markets. And when you get to listen to lawyers talk about where the business is going to come from, which is a daily concern. I mean, it gets down to very practical. I've got this big case now, but it's about to settle. What am I going to do? I spent 60 years thinking I'm never going to get another case. I mean, this is really bad. And then something happens. So the markets, uh, certainly in firms with offices in other places, can heat up. And Texas is a place that heated up about five years ago, they made a concerted effort to bring to them, maybe more than five years, technology companies with patent issues. And they did things to attract those companies. And the lawyers followed them like a shadow. It was like, there's the technology company, and there are the lawyers. Hi, I'm with you. Yeah, we're going to Texas. Yeah, right. Okay. That would be good. And that is a natural event. So that's a dimension to what we're talking about here that I think is, is very important. The lawyers, uh, I say I know the lawyers. I met a lot of Texas lawyers over the years. Some of them were just world-class criminal lawyers. And um, they, like, they like to do the work. And when someone is indicted, I guarantee you, there'll be somebody standing next to them, a lawyer, who will come up with all kinds of arguments. Every argument that we have heard today that might be made will be made. And they will, they will fight. Um, they uh, love that work and they will do it. Same thing is true in California. Before we get to what they're doing, let me just say that uh, I lived, I was born in 1934. My father had an office in downtown Boston when we drove home. We went down, I think it was Huntington Avenue, and there was a huge building on the right with four buildings. 
I think of it now in my memory as dark. And that building was filled with young women who were pregnant. And there were nuns. And that was, to me, a scary, I'd be 14, 15, 16. That was like a scary thing. They had, as I thought then, they had sinned. That's where we're going, based on the conservative picture. It has been underestimated in the last five, ten years, the dangers of it and the conservative vision by those in that party. I'm not talking politics, but that's where they want to go, and they have to be stopped. There's two groups that might stop them. One, the lawyers. Secondly, the judges. And interestingly enough, based on the history of the last years, it's the conservative judges very often that have to save the day. Burger, the Burger Court wasn't going to tolerate Nixon. Unanimous decision on the takes unanimous decision, and that's a line to watch. On the, the basic point of the number, we go to the next, uh, next one, thank you, uh, and the next one after that. Um, here's quickly a few groups, and then a, a word about Dallas. Uh, 70 law firms joined the Legal Alliance for Reproductive Rights called OPLAR. Lawyers helping with civil and criminal issues. And these are actual volunteer lawyers who are taking over the cases. What has been mentioned, I think sometimes, if you don't mind me just giving my opinion on this, we, we focus as we should on gender, we focus as we should on people of color, I would add to that the concern I have about class in the United States. That the American dream works a lot, but it, you have to be able to move from one area to another. And that problem comes up in this issue of abortion. What are you going to do, not if you're, you know, uptown, what are you going to do if you become pregnant and you live in an area and there's no, basically no funds for anything and you're not employed? And how many of those people will there be? And will some prosecutor decide to prosecute them? Next. Law firms and state attorney general offer pro bono legal services. Uh, and this is in New York. Uh, there is an organization, and one of my partners is part of it. Uh, New York healthcare providers with subpoenas representing hospitals, clinics, medical providers, fighting travel bans, and Mars and Foster hosted a virtual training. So somewhere on, on the line you can go and look at the training. And let's go next. Lawyers for good government. Who's, who's opposed? Anybody here opposed to that? I'm opposed to that member, Abby, early member. What? Early member, one of the first members. Yeah, you, you, yeah, good for you. <laughs> Dozens of law firms helping on laws throughout the country. National advocates for pregnant women. If, this is an organization I really call If, When, How. And they run a repro legal helpline. You can call up and you can ask for help. Of course, what this means to all of us is all we have to do is pick up the phone this afternoon, it's Friday, and call and join and get committed. And it's going to take that. Next item, please. The Rappaport Center of Human Rights and Justice at the University of City of Texas at Austin. You see what I mean about not writing off Texas as, oh my, that's a terrible place. These, these are people doing things. 
supporting defense counsel who are representing indigent defendants criminally charged. I don't have the stats on how many there are right now, but there's some. Okay? What that shows is as far as jurisprudence and the Supreme Court, at the moment, the majority has a lack of empathy, and there's none of it in the opinion. That is the understanding of other people's problems, which is a good thing for a judge to have. What have we got next? We have the Planned Parenthood, of course we do. And there they are, and they're doing wonderful things and have for a long, long time, and they refuse to give up. And next. Lawyers will fight. And lawyers get a bad rap. I have this in my book, by the way. And I've, I, I don't know how many lawyers I've seen that are doing wonderful things. And, uh, but they're misunderstood. And they will fight every inch of the way on this. I have a, a view that has no foundation at all, and you might think is completely hopeless. What if the country just rejects the Dobbs case? What if somehow it becomes clear that it cannot work? It's not working, and all kinds of travail is emanating from the effort to make it work. Is there in Kavanaugh some residual sentiment that can be used in some way? Or are they going to take us down with their concept of tradition in the Alito opinion? 71 pages, and he cites tradition. The tradition is in the 14th Amendment. I don't find the 14th Amendment difficult to understand. What is hard about this? Uh, you can't abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens. Privileges and immunities, all of them. Um, you can't, you have to, uh, you can't uh, hurt life, liberty, liberty, when you order a woman to bear a child, and that comes from the government, is it complicated to figure out what the founders of this country would have thought about that? When Alito, I'm testing myself out here because I'm a lawyer and I have to be, that's one of the problems we have right now. So I'll be calm. My wife is there. This is when she, if we were in private, she said, just calm down. Don't, don't yet. And I say, well, no, that's the way you look at it, you know, that I'm yelling. But for the Irish, it's just emphasis. That's all it is, okay? <laughs> Equal protection of the laws. Is that hard? You have to go cite cases in... 1868 as some kind of support for what you're doing all those years before women were allowed to vote and then who is this who has been already referenced in the decision what is this conservative vision that has us by the back at the moment. This is worth waiting for. This is uh, the reference to uh, by Justice Thomas. Here's what he said. For that reason, 
in future cases, we should reconsider all of this court's substantive due process precedents, including Griswold, Lawrence, Obergefell, because any substantive due process decision is dramatically erroneous, and he cites a case called Ramos. Contraception, out. Who is this man? Who is this guy? And what is his vision? I think I found out what I would like to say in future opportunities. I don't think we're going there. And I think what we need, more of them in Congress, are people that understand gay people fall in love, gay people should get married, and the most important, maybe the American people want that to be allowed. They want it to be allowed. And we are excluded in some way. If we have time, uh, there may be some questions. Yeah, we've got some time for questions. I actually wanted to um, add a little bit about the, the um, letter to Sidley and Austin. If you read it and, and put it in your materials, it is really bullying. Because not only are they talking about criminal prosecution to the law firm, they're talking about pulling their ticket to practice, disbarment. So that's an individual assault on the lawyers who are trying to provide support and equal treatment for the women in their law firm. It is bullying, plain and simple, the way I read that letter. So that's something that we really should be outraged by. And on the plus side, I didn't mention earlier, but Uber and Lyft have agreed to pay for any of their drivers who are prosecuted because they've tr transported a woman for abortion services. I think that Greyhound and United Airlines and should all adopt that and probably provide some free seats, but that's my vision. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> are, yes. Are any of you aware of particular cases where there have been prosecutions that you can talk about for people aiding and abetting? Not yet. There's, there's not. I, I mean, I, I've been following this pretty carefully, unless you all have heard, but I don't think there have been any aiding and abetting prosecutions yet. But my own view is what I said before, which is I don't think people wanted to do that before the election. Mm -hmm. Um, and we probably are going to see it post-election, and certain states have, have vowed to pass, you know, ever more draconian laws. Aiding and abetting, I was a federal prosecutor for five years, and I've defended criminal cases for a long time. Charging somebody with aiding and abetting is an admission that you really don't have a very good case. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's why I thought about when I was deciding how we, you know, aiding and abetting. Because there's rules about aiding and abetting, and one of them is you have to understand that what you're assisting and helping is illegal. That, and that becomes easy when you pack uh, 45 immigrants at the border into a truck and, you know, you drive off and then nobody has any uh, credentials or documents and, you know, that that's, you can do that. Transportation is actually a crime, so that's more, that's specific. There's another thing I was going to mention to you, not that it will happen a lot, but there is a thing in the law, it's very interesting, called jury nullification. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen very often, but it's this kind of case. Make my day and tell me I can go argue this to a jury. I did once. It's in my book, actually. I did, I did once, but you have to be subtle because the judge, what? What? <laughs> uh, and, and that is, for example, helping slaves escape slaves in New England and Boston, there was jury nullification. Punching a priest who abused the person accused when they were young. Nullification. They're not going to do it. But I say again, it doesn't happen very often. Um, and uh, 
the, the I don't think that Texas is an aberration. I think that there are prosecutors in, given the number of states with these kind of statutes uh, that will uh, that will bring cases. But I, I did mention one last thing, if I may, and that, and that is. Excuse me, have you noticed how many lawyers there are in the state of Texas? There's huge buildings filled, or they're working at home, but the building, <laughs> the building used to be packed with all these people, all these lawyers. And, you know, you Mr. DA or you Mr. Attorney General, have you decided that law firms shouldn't bring technology companies down here? Technology companies have to have lawyers every day uh, in-house. In what if they get pregnant? They have not thought it through. They have not thought it through, I'm hoping. Representing providers, we've been very grateful that the Texas legislature went after the law firms because the law firms have the yeah. with all the resources and the willingness to really fight this. I'd much rather a law firm be at the receiving end of an aiding and abetting lawsuit than you know serve one of our providers in California. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it is scary, kind of scary though for the reasons uh, were mentioned. Question. Uh, I'm wondering. One of obviously, obviously Dobbs had a lot of scary language in it for a lot of different reasons. And I agree that Thomas's concurrence was like horrifying to read, right? It was right up a nightmare. Um, but there are being there are steps now being taken to kind of prevent the things that he referenced, right? So like just earlier this week you had the Respect for Marriage Act that got forwarded in uh, the Senate. And I'm wondering, do you guys believe that this helps or hurts this general argument that's being forwarded. Because on the one hand, obviously, it's great to have federal protections for the recognition of marriage, regardless of the gender of the individuals involved. But on the other hand, it almost gives more credence to the fact that substantive due process has been thrown out entirely. And so there have to now be new legislative acts to protect it. And so I was wondering if you guys have any thoughts or comments on that. I'm a big believer in legislation um, as a as a stopgap measure. We had this actually very discussion yesterday in Calif in California about whether you want to do a statute and an executive order on an issue. I mean, you're correct. It, it somewhat concedes that the substantive due process rights are potentially at stake um, with the Supreme Court. But I I still think that's a good you know measure to do that. It, because it also evidences that the population is in support of this, which it is. And the, in my view, the Supreme Court should not be such an outlier in what the, where the population is. I actually, uh, we stumbled on something I know about. <laughs> I argued a substantive due process case in the Supreme Court. Rehnquist uh, hated substantive due process. Uh, substantive due process boiled down to it's essentially so that you got to do the government has to do the right thing, and Breck was really disliked that idea, and uh, I lost seven to two. I got Brennan and I got Marshall, for obvious reasons. But the, the middle people, I think Stewart was there, still there, and all of that. So substantive due process has been an enemy, really, of conservative justices. Um, it, but that's a total distraction for the reason I gave you. Maybe I'm a simple lawyer, but I've read you the words in the 14th Amendment. Now then, then there's the history of the United States of the 70 years that did everything, that court did everything it could to eliminate substantive due process. And to basically, my simple-minded translation of it was after the Civil War and after the 14th Amendment was passed, they held cases, I've read them, which said, well, it didn't really mean to be equality for people of color. I mean, that's, not, that's a reach and we just, uh, and we don't like that. And that lasted. That's the problem 
but that we are all facing today, which is, will Roe v. Wade be gone for 50 years? Will it be like Plessy versus Ferguson? Is that it? I see, I say again, this will not hold. Now, now that's an optimistic view. You know, if I may digress, the Irish were optimistic because they had to be, because for 800 years they said the British will leave soon. <laughs> and I don't know if you noticed it, but the British are still in Northern Ireland. And you know, they, they'll be leaving soon. Uh, so it, it's a, this will not last. We have, we have social media. We have the avenues. We have the way to react. Of course, we're busy. You're, you're all busy lawyers, and we've got to go do things that have nothing to do with abortion, and we've got to worry about the Ukraine, I guess, and all that stuff. This will not go away. It will get worse for the public relations. There will be as there was a 10-year-old girl who is raped by a relative, and the court did it. Tell me that court didn't allow that. Tell me. Can I get philosophical? So, I mean, let me just throw in one thing here. Please do. The one positive that I'm seeing out of all of this is voting. This is engaging particularly the younger members of our country in politics. They're seeing the importance of getting the vote out. And the numbers are there for, and the, the, numbers for are there. the young ones. I, yeah. And I, I completely agree with you, Jim. I, I also, you know, because I sort of came of age when Roe came mm -hmm. down. At the time Roe, and I don't think I said this before, but at the time Roe was decided, the religious, medical, public health establishments were all in favor of legalizing abortions because they had seen the devastating impacts on women. And I think we're going to go back there. It, it may take 10 years, but we're going to see that again. And I think we had pretty much everybody of reproductive age right now, came, you know, they've lived their whole lifetime where this right was just there. They didn't even think about it. They just assumed it was there. And all of a sudden, if you're in the South and the Midwest and you, become, you have to think a lot about you know, could I become pregnant? And if I become pregnant, what do I do? Where do I go? I have friends who say their children are looking at where to go to college yes. is based on this. You know, they, they, a friend of mine said she took her, child, her son to see Tulane in Louisiana and said to him and his friend, you will have to think about, do you want to go to college here? Because, you know, God forbid you get somebody pregnant. It's not so easy. You can't get an abortion here or in any of the neighboring states. So I, I do think we're going to, and we're going to see a shift. Here's what's wrong with Dobbs, in my in my opinion. John Dewey uh, could be could be argued was the greatest American philosopher, and in his book on psychology, I'm reading it this week, and I like to disgorge my learning whenever I can immediately because it might fade, I might forget it. Who knows? Uh, that logic has to do with the consequences of an act. And he gives many good examples, not principles, not principles like tradition, which is the word, one of the words in his opinion. But what are the consequences of the act? So for example, it's uh, tradition, uh, it's an important principle that uh, you go see your mother on Mother's Day, okay? Uh, but the consequences have to be examined, and until that is done, the logic is not complete. Your mother has COVID, you're not going to go today. That's a consequence. If I ever saw an opinion in the Supreme Court that did not consider the consequences of what they were doing, Dobbs is that case. Plessy versus Ferguson is another. The one about slavery in, uh, in 1850, uh, that they weren't human and so forth, horrible stuff. Uh, what are the consequences? Are they responsible for that? Are they responsible for the symbolism? Not only what the words are, but the symbolism of Dobbs. To, because it has unleashed people all over the country to do terrible things. 
You mean they didn't think about that? They didn't know about that? Well, okay. And one of the consequences, if you believe that the logic of Freakonomics, Freakonomics concluded that Roe v. Wade ended up or resulted in reduced crime because children that were born were wanted and lived in families that were more stable and therefore less likely to end up on the streets in their later life. Well, not only that, because I've done a lot of talks about this, if you look at the status of women post legalization of contraception, which for single women was only two years before Roe, you see, and, you know, women were then allowed to go to college and graduate school and enter the workforce because they could choose if, when, and how to have children. And so the, the consequences of Roe and legalization of abortion was profound. Um, and who knows what's going to happen, you know, now. I think there's much more ways to work around it because of medication abortion and, um, and the proliferation of travel funds and the like. But we're, I think the consequence that really scandalizes me is the broadening of the gap in this country yes, between yes. the elite and the non-elite. Mm -hmm. There you go. There's does. your class. Yes. Even in the politics, even in my own party, sometimes I think I see it. Well, it's, uh, I don't want to distract it, but I agree with you. I agree with you. Well, in many of these states which have these really draconian bans, they also do not have the social you know, support systems in place. Right. Women. So these people are just really plunged into deeper and deeper states of poverty, you know, yeah. I, absolutely. Yeah. That's a huge consequence. And particularly in the states where there are very conservative, conservative Christian groups that 50 years ago would have been your support system. Mm -hmm. But it cannot be under the current mental thinking. You know, the history of all this is fascinating. How did we get here? <laughs> I mean, today, where are we? What is this? Yeah. What, what is happening? And forgive me, but I, I get very interested in the social upheavals of uh, things that I witnessed over the years. Uh, but, but my dad got angry at me one of two times in my whole life because he was trying to listen to the Nazis marching into Poland and uh, this is at that level. This is, you might as well have written an opinion. Women go home. Uh, women have 11 children. Have 12 children like my great-grandmother. Have 12 children. That is your job. I'm telling you. My opinion tells you what to do. If that's not authoritarian in an American democracy, I don't know what is. I'm telling you what we're going to have you do because it's a tradition. I asked a question yesterday. It was a wonderful lecture by three great scholars on the Constitution. It comes like everything in this world is on YouTube or whatever. And I was able to ask a question about, they were talking about tradition in the Dobbs case. And I said, how can they use tradition when there's been bias against almost everybody, including going back to the Puritans? Anybody you know, know your history of the Puritans landing on Plymouth Rock? They, they were an unacceptable religion. And so they got in boats and Plymouth was born. And, uh, well, it's fun. <laughs> to talk about it, not to do it, not to do it, it but to talk about it is, uh, I, I've, I've seen, we're not going to take this, it's that simple. We're not. We are not. What am I going to do? I am on social media today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't get a million, one hundred thousand. Followers. You know, you know that my that I want to just tell you this. Thing. I got thirty thousand hits in London from my 
blast about the lawyers are not going to take it. I just, and knowing some English people, I can just imagine them wandering around and Lincoln's in saying, well, all the lawyers are going to revolt in America. <laughs> Is that true? Are they really true? Who said that? Uh, Brother, they can't pronounce the Irish name, you know, Brother, Brother Nahano. Or... <laughs> Yes, Jim, Jim is the uh, legal equivalent of Taylor Swift on that. <laughs> Who's that? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Do you seen any... Have you seen any legislation either forwarded or, or passed kind of taking the ideas forwarded in the Dobbs opinion and taking them from a different angle. I know one of my first thoughts was like, oh, they're saying that medical choices are no longer a privacy right, and it's right in the midst of everyone saying, I don't have to get a vaccine if I don't want to, I don't have to wear a mask if I don't want to. Yeah. And I was like, you've just handed the states the ability to legislate that everybody has to do that. And so like, my immediate thought was kind of a backlash in that way. And has like, anyone seen anything Use that. But I, I'd like to mention, I agree with you completely, you, but it would have to be articulated. And that's how you would, you, you take, uh, not the people that marched into the Capitol, but take the people that really believe their liberty is threatened, mm -hmm. and have the person who can talk about that, that way that you just said, and say, isn't it, it's obvious that these people are denied liberty. Don't you agree with that? And you get, not all of them, you get some, you get enough to make a difference. Because I've been fascinated by their cries of liberty, and I don't think, uh, I, they, what they really mean is liberty for themselves. Mm -hmm. That's what they really mean. And isn't that kind of what we all mean, sort of? I mean, but, um, yeah, that, that's, but have you heard that argument by anybody? No, no effort to make, that's where you get back to your class. I just, I'm terrible now, and I just picture these uh, effetes wandering around giving political advice in Washington. I, mean, I would clean them all up, <laughs> both parties, out, move the capital to St. Louis. Uh, just, St. Louis? It, well, <laughs> Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I go with Japika, maybe. I'm getting, I'm getting carried away, I can tell. There is a lot of legislation happening right now, both in uh, progressive states like California, Massachusetts, and New York. We passed 16 bills this past session protecting um, providers, um, expanding infrastructure, I mean, a whole host of things. And then similarly in the banned states, there's just a lot of legislation going the other way, and so I think what we're going to see in the next year or two is just a lot of litigation, because there's now direct conflicts between a state like Texas, which says you're aiding and abetting if you, um, per, you know, if you provide assistance to somebody in Texas, and California saying we're not going to extradite our providers, we're not going to allow you to go after, you know, take a, the license away from our providers in California. So we're, we're seeing, as a result of the Supreme Court decision, we're seeing this absolute clash between all these different states, and that's going to play itself out. So it's going to be a, from a legal perspective, you know, it's an incredibly interesting time, but very depressing. I so, don't know if anyone took the kind of logic of this opinion and applied it to something else, you know, because I think that obviously and understandably the focus has been on reproductive rights and safety around that and providing as much safety and stability as possible in a totally new era felt like essentially to stop myself from just spiraling into like what this world was going to be. I was like, well, but look at all of these things that would be argued immediately as unconstitutional by the same people using this logic, right? And almost well, like a logic trap. Several so states way. have introduced um, anti-contraception bills. And, I mean, that's just terrifying. Whoever thought that contraception would be become illegal? I, I don't think ultimately they're going to pass and they'll stand up with that step on the chopping block because of that, that's the way to argue it. There was a professor yesterday on the program I watched named Sullivan, an absolutely brilliant person, 
And uh, Keyes made a wonderful living arguing in the Supreme Court by turning the cases in some acceptable way. And uh, certainly liberty is the key. And, but it has this horrible history, like a lot of things in law. Uh, but, uh, if only we could also add empathy. That's a legal theory. Empathy would be good. So it is 1130. Uh, thank you all for attending. And let's have a really <laughs>